to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Thank God for the beautiful relationship of husbands and wives and how they have the ability to help one another get to heaven. Today, in our topical study of the book of Proverbs, we're going to look at some great advice and wisdom that will help husbands and wives in their relationship together and in their journey toward heaven. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. Our lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. We hope that you'll stop by in your local area and visit the Lord's Church. Uh, they'd love to have you for their Bible study or worship on Sunday or Wednesday. And if you'd like to sit down with them and, and study the Scriptures or you'd like to learn more about the church, friend, they'd be happy to have a Bible study with you and talk to you about the Word of God. Here at the Gospel of Christ, that's our hope and aim as well. We want to help men and women know God and His Word better and ultimately help people make it to heaven. Please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a good variety of Bible study tools that are available free of charge. We have DVD and audio file formats that you can download, or if you'd like to have a hard copy of today's lesson, uh, you can download those as well, or fill out a media request form, and we'd be happy to send those to you. And if you've got a smartphone, you can download our app, whether it be from the Apple Store for an iPhone or the Google Store from uh, Android, those are really good tools that will help you as well in your study of the Word of God. Husbands and wives, each of us need the encouragement and the help to be the kind of helper, helpmate that God has designed us to be to truly make it to heaven. And the book of Proverbs offers a, a, a lot of encouragement and advice to both husbands and wives. And we want to consider some of that to make ourselves better spouses in this life and preparing for eternity. What's some of the admonition that Proverbs gives us? Here's the first one. One of the first admonitions that we receive is that husbands and wives, both of them, need to make a commitment to be faithful to their spouses. I want you to open your book, open your Bible, your Old Testament, to the book of Proverbs, and I want you to look in chapter 5, verses 15 through 19 with me. That's Proverbs 5. Look in verses 15 through 19. The Word of God says this, Drink water from your own cistern, and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Friend, a, a lesson that is so clear and so simple and yet that needs to be echoed so loudly today is that marriage is a strong commitment. When you say, I do, when you make that marriage vow, you are making a commitment to be faithful to your wife or your husband and them alone. You know, the, the writer talks about drinking fountains and cisterns, and, and you can understand that. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. You don't want your fountain dispersed abroad in the streets. Let them be your own. You know, a, a lot of people can relate to this. If I've got a cup of coffee or if I've got a water bottle, as much as I might like you or somebody else, I'd really rather you not put your lips on that. 
Now that's personal, that's, that's a matter of hygiene, I understand that, and, and probably not anything harmful to that, but you can kind of understand. I don't want somebody else drinking out of my, own, my drink, that's mine, and I'd rather not do that. Well, the point is this, husbands and wives have made a commitment to each other and to each other only. They need to be faithful in their commitment to one another. Be enraptured with her love. Let the husband and wife satisfy each other and make a commitment to that. I believe we live in such a, a disposable, drive-through mentality in our society that if you're not happy with your wife, just like something else or your husband, you can just kind of wad it up, throw it in the trash, and be done with it. Go, go get you another one. Well, that's not the way marriage is. Marriage is a commitment for life. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Genesis 2, 24, For this reason man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. How long, Lord? There is no how long. It's for life. How long is not even addressed because it's not even an option. Jesus said in Matthew 19, verses 1 through 9, that what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. In the original plan, what we're trying to get across is, in the original plan, there's not an option for what if. It's for life. It's forever. It's for, it's for this life to, to last the whole time until one of them passes from this life. And so make a commitment and be faithful to your spouse. Here's what Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 2. Uh, he's asked about marriage, and, and he's asked about sexual morality, and the, and the time they're living in, should they marry? And Paul says, yes, it's okay to. He said, but because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man, listen now, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. One man, one life, one wife, committed to each other for life, being faithful to each other. That's God's plan for marriage. And friend, that's how husbands and wives are going to make it through this life, to say to themselves when they marry and when they make that commitment, this is it. There aren't any what-ifs or loopholes or annullings or... Uh, no, this is it. We're going to make it work for life. Am I going to promise you that every day is going to be rosy and you're going to be on an emotional high every day? No, that's not life. But friend, you help each other through the highs and the lows because you made a commitment. I'm going to be faithful no matter what. And that's one of the keys to making marriage work. And then as we think about what the Bible says, the book of Proverbs says to husbands and wives, let's also realize this principle. Husbands and of course a wife as well, spouses, husbands and wives must realize the value of a good spouse, the value of a good wife, and you've got to cherish them and their value to the family. You may be familiar with the passage we're talking about, but I want you to look at it with me again. Would you open your Bible in the book of Proverbs to Proverbs chapter 18? And I want you to see what God says about the value of a good wife. Proverbs chapter 18. I want you to look in verse number 22. The Word of God says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It doesn't just happen. It's, it's, it's a good thing. It's found. It's something given by God. But friend, you've got to realize the value of your spouse. Think about how lonely it would be. Think about how hard it would be to go through life alone. What if you never had anybody to share that with? What if you never had anybody to lean on, to, to, to talk to in the difficult times, to encourage and, and help one another and just share sometimes the monotony of life? Friend, that's the value that our spouses possess, and that's the value we have to each other, and we really need to realize how, how good that is. Again, Genesis 2.18. Here's what God said about it. It's not good that man should be alone. God saw already. Ahead of time, God realized, I did not make man to be a loner, isolated, on an island, or in a monastery. That's not the way man's made. It's not good that man should be alone. What do you mean, God? I'll make a helper for him, comparable to him, to help him. God made us helpmates because we're not designed to be loners in this life. And so realize how good it is that you've been blessed with a godly spouse. It, it's like a, a valuable treasure. 
If you found a treasure, let's say you found a, a diamond or a piece of gold or a, some real valuable piece of art, what would you do with that? Well, that'd be a treasure to you. You'd clean it up, you'd take care of it, you'd honor it, you'd cherish it, you'd, you'd do whatever to take care of it. It has value. It's important to you, and you're going to show that respect to it. Same thing relates to husbands and wives. Realize your importance to each other and that you truly have the ability to help one another in this life. And then as we think about the book of Proverbs, let's realize this. For marriage to reach its, its lofty and divine purpose, husbands and wives have got to completely trust each other. I want you to notice what's said in Proverbs 31, verse number 11, about the virtuous wife and, and how her husband feels about her. This virtuous wife who is exalted very greatly in the book of Proverbs. Notice what is said in Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 11. The Bible says, The heart of her husband safely trust her, so he will have no lack of gain. You know, for it to work. And, and this is, I think, sometimes where people get paranoid or get jealous or they begin to question and wonder. Uh, for it to work in marriage, I've got to trust that my wife and my husband has made that commitment as well and that we truly are in it together. And, and trust ought to be given to that person unless there's some reason that they show that they can't be trusted, which hopefully is not the case. But for marriage to work, You've got to trust each other. How many people can go through life happy if they've got to be looking behind their back or over their shoulder all the time? If I've got to be wondering, you know, what's going on here? Is this right? If I'm always nervous or anxious? No, you'll never be happy. You'll never achieve the best if that's the way you go through life. Now, some people go through life like that without a reason. And friend, the encouragement is trust each other. Help each other. Uh, trust has got to be given. Now, sometimes it has to be earned as well if there's been problems that arise. But do your best to trust one another in this life and to truly help each other. And that'll make the marriage so much better. A godly spouse in the book of Proverbs is also something that ought to be of high praise in our lives. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, we mention again from the virtuous wife, and I want you to notice what is said about her in Proverbs 31, verse number 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. You know, for marriage to really work, for us to really be a helper to one another, we need to praise one another. We need to encourage one another. Uh, the husband and the wife both need that encouragement and that help. Don't take it for granted. It's one of the main things we want to emphasize here. You know, you can get in a rut and you can go through life and you can just kind of think, well, this is the way it is and this is the way it ought to be and, and just kind of uh, in a rut doing those things. Don't do that. Don't, don't take it for granted. Realize what a God-given blessing it is to have a husband or a wife who's trying to help you get to heaven. And don't forget to praise them. She's worthy of praise. Her husband, he, he rises up and calls her blessed, and he also praises her. And if you read that context, he ought to be. She's working hard. She's helping the family. She's burning the midnight oil. She's uh, doing everything to make him and the family look good. And, and she's a good, godly wife. And how many of us have husbands or wives like that that are really trying hard? And that we, we need to say thank you. That we need to let them know how beautiful they are, how, how much we recognize what they're doing, even if it's small things. How much we recognize what they're doing, the overlooked things that we really don't overlook them, and that we really try to encourage one another. You know, in the book of Proverbs, the godly husband, the godly wife, one of the great things that's mentioned here and an encouragement for, for, for every one of us is uh, their main goal ought to be the building up of the home and not its ruin. Notice what the Bible says in Proverbs 14, verse number 1, about the main objective of a godly wife or husband. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 1, The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. What's the, 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 one of the main objectives, especially since the wife has some of that responsibility in the home, to build it up, 
to, to encourage, to make that an environment where people can be happy and healthy, where people can grow and, and children can be brought up in the nurture and admiration of the Lord, where the Bible can be openly studied, where, where, where we know that this is a loving environment, where people are going to be helped in life to succeed. And so the building of the home and especially the building up of it spiritually, that's something that every home ought to strive to have. And every father, every mother, every husband and wife, ought to try to build that up and make it the best environment possible for each other and for their children to know the Lord and to get to heaven. Friend, as we think about these things, let's also think about some things in the marriage that, that need to be avoided, if we can use that language. There's some things that we need to do that'll help the marriage from the book of Proverbs, and then there are some things that are really not good if they're in the marriage relationship and they need to be avoided from the book of Proverbs. Notice these. I want you to look in your Bible in Proverbs chapter 19, uh, verse number 13. Any husband or wife who is constantly uh, nagging uh, and not building up is not going to make a happy marriage. And Proverb, uh, the, Proverb, the book of Proverbs kind of illustrates this in a very vivid way. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 13. The Bible says this, A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and listen to this, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. Uh, today's Living Bible, kind of a paraphrase, puts it this way. A rebellious son is calamity to his father, and listen to this phraseology, and a nagging wife annoys like a constant dripping. Nagging in the marriage, and by that we mean constantly harping, maybe in a negative, constantly tearing down, constant discouragement, that kind of attitude, friend, that's going to tear down the home. That, that's going to uh, annoy and bring heartache to the marriage. Now, you can kind of think of what it's like. This is a, a vivid illustration. All of us have probably had this happen to us in our life. You ever maybe been sitting in a chair trying to relax? Maybe you're in the recliner sitting or relaxing, or maybe you were laying in bed. And you hear this sound, drip, drip, drip. Can you sleep having to listen to that over, when you know in the back of your mind, you know, that's annoying, that needs to be fixed, and every time, every drop of water is going to cost me on the water bill, well, what's that constant dripping like? Well, that's annoying. That's kind of like somebody grating their fingers across a, a chalkboard. Well, that's the, that's the vividness of somebody in the marriage relationship constantly nagging or harping or, or, or bickering or trying to always saying, spewing negative venom that's going to uh, bring people down. In the marriage, that just won't work. You cannot be constantly nagging. Husband or wife, okay, you can go both ways. The husband or the wife cannot be constantly nagging and expect that to be a marriage that's going to be good and right and holy. In fact, the descriptive terms in the book of Proverbs get even more vivid. The book of Proverbs says that you'd be better off to live alone than to live in a mansion, as it were, with a mean husband or a mean wife. I want you to look at these verses with me from Proverbs. Look in Proverbs chapter 21. Look in your Bible in verse number 9. That's Proverbs chapter 21. I want you to look in verse number 9. The Word of God says, Better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Now flip over to Proverbs 25, verse number 24. The Word of God says this, It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Both those verses say the same thing. But friend, this is emphasized multiple times and in various ways throughout the book of Proverbs, and it goes for the husband or the wife. You'd be better off to, to live in just a little corner of the rooftop than to live in a mansion filled with luxury with a mean or angry person. One paraphrase puts it this way. I kind of like the language here. It's not necessarily exact to the Hebrew, I don't think, but it gets the point across. The Living Bible a paraphrase says it this way. It's better to live in the corner of an attic than with a crabby woman in a lovely home. 
Now that's pretty vivid, isn't it? You'd be better off setting you up a tent in the corner of your attic than to live with somebody who's mean or crabby all the time. That just won't work. If somebody's mean, somebody's grouchy, if somebody's negative, and you live in the biggest, let's say you've got the biggest mansion with all the luxuries in the world, and you've got to share it with a mean person. You're married to that person. How's that going to work out? You'd be better off to live in a shack with somebody who's nice and kind and loving than to live in luxury with a mean person. What's the, what's the writer's point? What's that all about? Living with somebody who's unkind, who is mean, who's grouchy, you won't ever live in happiness in that type of marriage. If that's the individual, if you're the individual, if I'm the individual, we all probably are at times, a little grouchy and a little crabby, hey, I need to work on that. I don't want to be mean or unkind or, 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 or a grouch all the time. We want to be happy and upbeat and encourage others. And that's something that we all need to guard ourselves against and watch out for as it relates to these things. Now, one of the things that the book of Proverbs does exalt is a husband or wife that is practical, uh, one who's efficient, and one who is really a blessing from the Lord. I want you to look in Proverbs chapter 19 at verse number 14 uh, about what God says here about the prudent wife. Proverbs 19, would you look with me in verse number 14? The Bible says, Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Prudent means uh, wise, practical, efficient, one who can uh, take what they know, baby, and put that to practical use in everyday life, one who's good at helping things go smoothly in the home. Uh, Proverbs 12 verse 4 says it this way, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. Let's make sure that we're doing our part, that we're trying to help and be efficient and be useful and, and helpful in the home and, and not just being lazy or wasteful uh, in the marriage relationship. And then friend, as we think about practical advice from the book of Proverbs, here's some that will help marriages so much. The Bible teaches that a hateful spirit or a, a hateful attitude will ruin marriages very quickly and will make them unbearable. I want you to open your, book, your Bible to the book of Proverbs chapter 30 and I want you to look at what the writer here says about this in verses 21 through 23. That's Proverbs chapter 30. I want you to look with me in verses 21 through 23. The Bible says this, for three things the earth is perturbed, or uh, the idea is upset about. The earth is perturbed. Yes, for four, it cannot bear it up. These things are just not right. For a servant, when he reigns. A fool, when he's filled with food. A hateful woman, when she is married. And a maidservant, who succeeds her mistress. These are just things that are all not according to the proper course things that kind of are not right, as it were, upsets the course of things, if we can use that language. And one of them is a hateful woman when she's married. And friend, that goes both ways. A hateful man as well. Don't be hateful. Don't be mean. Don't be bitter and unkind. Try to find something good to say. Try to uplift and encourage one another in every way. You know, sometimes people hold grudges, and sometimes people get mad about things and they just can't get over them. That's not what the Bible says we ought to do. What do we, what do, we do if we really love someone? Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It, it's really different than the way a lot of people think today. 1 Corinthians 13 gives the proper attitude of love. Beginning in verse number 4, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. That is, it's, it's not jealous. Love does not parade itself. It doesn't say, look at me. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, 
endures all things. True love is going to do its best to find the good and to make marriage what God wants it to be. And thus, Paul would say in Ephesians 5, in a great chapter about husbands and wives, in verses 21 through 31, Paul is going to say, Husbands, I want you to love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for you. Wives, I want you to submit to your husbands, just as the church is in submission to Christ. And in doing so, having that proper relationship will help the marriage so much. Friend, in that chapter, verses 21 through 31 of Ephesians 5, although he's talking and using marriage as an illustration, really the lesson is about Christ and the church. Christ is the head. We are the church. And inside that beautiful relationship, Christ has done everything possible to make us the beautiful bride. He's given Himself for us. He's washed us and cleansed us, cleansed us by the washing of water and the Word. He, he has given us His life and His example as a pattern. And what does He want of us but to show respect, to give Him the honor, to realize He's the one in authority, and that we can submit to Him and know He has our best interest at heart. Friend, as you think about relationships and as we think about our relationship with the Lord. Let's make sure that it's what it needs to be first. No marriage can reach its highest potential unless God and Christ are the head of that marriage and the head of that home. Is God really ruling in your life? Are you a child of God? Have you submitted your will to the will of God? If you're not a Christian, friend, we want to encourage you to become one today. Believe in Jesus. Repent of those things in your life that may not be right. Confess His name before men and be immersed in water. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And friend, let's each of us strive harder. Let's each of us do more. L let's make a commitment that I'm going to do my best to help my spouse, my husband or wife, to get to heaven and to make sure we have a godly home. May God help each of us to really be the husband or wife we ought to be. May God encourage you in your marriage and may you join us next time as we study God's Word together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.